Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is our authority. The Bible is our interest. The Bible is our everything because the Bible is the Word of God. I still can't get used to the idea, even though I've known this all my life, that here God has given us a book written by God himself containing the most precious truths imaginable, truths that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. And, and it's all written in this book, the Bible. Yet mankind, even though he has heard frequently of the Bible, it has been a bestseller for hundreds of years, uh, yet uh, mankind do not realize how authoritative, how important the Bible is. It is God's Word. And it is telling us things that every human being ought to know about, very, very serious things. And that's why it is such a delight to me that night after night we can sit together and, and uh, talk together about the Bible. What does it say about this? What does it say about that? And, of course, we have to be very careful. We never want to go to the Bible and, with our preconceived ideas uh, as to what we think the Bible ought to say or what God ought to do. We want to always approach the Bible with the attitude, I don't know anything, Lord. You teach me. You teach me. And whatever I learn there, uh, could it be that I might be obedient to what I find there? Now, we have listeners to uh, this program in many, many countries. Here is a listener uh, to our Arabic programming. He actually lives in Holland, uh, in Europe. And uh, there are many er people who are uh, from the Arabian, uh, the Arab side of the world, uh, who live in Europe. And he asks this question, what are the fruits of the Spirit and good works that please God? It's very interesting. He uh, uh, spoke in the same sentence about the fruits of the Spirit and good works because they do relate. We read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, tenderness, goodness, uh, faith, and so on. Uh, the curious thing is the first fruit that is mentioned there is love. And love gets right into good works. Because when we read uh, uh, John chapter 15, and we always compare Scripture with Scripture, We're all, we always look in the Bible uh, to find more information about any subject that we are interested in. And we read in verse 21 of John 14, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And, or it says in verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And the words are, are everything that the Bible teaches. So when the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, and so on, the moment we get to the word love, we can say the fruit of the Spirit is that there's an intense desire on the part of, of the tr true child of God to do the will of God. And if we do not find that desire, if indeed we are not living to do the will of God uh, because of our delight in the Word of God, we are not a child of God. It is as simple as that. Of course, there are those who are desperately trying to do the will of God as best they can, because they think that by doing uh, God's will, being obedient to Him, uh, they will somehow attain unto a right relationship with God. They have it all wrong. We, uh, if we're trying to keep the law of God as perfectly as possible, in order to become right with God, we're going to end up in hell for sure, because that simply means that we're trusting in what we do. 
But I but the way it really works is that God saves us. That's a mystery that is a wonderful thing that only God can do. And he gives us a new resurrected soul in which we have an intense desire to do the will of God so that we are happiest when we are doing the will of God. And that uh, will be the first of the fruits of the Spirit that will be seen in our lives. And that obedience to the Word of God uh, will also mean that uh, love, that joy and peace and kindness and tenderness and faith and and goodness will also flow out from our lives. It begins with salvation. And how marvelous, how wonderful it is that we are living in a day of salvation, a day when God is saving. He himself has so declared it, a great multitude which no man can number. And you, anyone who is still unsaved, if you still are unsaved, you have just as great a possibility of becoming saved as any other individual in the whole world. Well, thank you very much, Harlan, for that question, or my Arabic friend for that question. And now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. I wanted to see if you could look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 32, and how what you teach agrees with that concerning the church. And I'll take my answer over the air. Ephesians 5, 20, uh, Ephesians 5, 25 to 33? Yes. Uh, 20, uh, well... Uh, all right. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, right at this point, we have to ask a question. What church is God talking about? Every true believer is a member of the eternal church. Uh, God is still building his eternal church. That goes on right as long as uh, this world lasts as long as people is uh, people are becoming saved and it is this eternal church that god gave himself for and it is this eternal church that is the bride of christ now you notice i've introduced the word eternal uh, be, it's not in there in our uh, verse here but nevertheless this has to be understood this way because God also speaks of uh, the church of Ephesus or the church of Sardis or the church of Smyrna or the church of any, uh, the Baptist church or the Methodist church or the, uh, Christian, the Christian Reformed church or the Roman Catholic church. We have lots of local congregations. God is not speaking about a local church in this passage. He is talking about the eternal church. The local church is not the bride of Christ. The, Christ did not give his life in order uh, to save everybody in the local congregation. The local congregation should have some true believers within it. Ideally, they ought to all be true believers, but that never is the case. Uh, but the fact is that it also has a, it can have a great many who are not true believers. They are not the bride of Christ. They are not a part of the eternal church. And, and so the church that has been sanctified uh, and cleansed with the washing of the word is the eternal church, which is the sprinkling of true believers throughout the church age. They are found in the various churches and congregations uh, mixed in with many who uh, think they are saved but who are not saved. And now that we've come to the end of the church age, they are found outside of the local congregations. They are, if, they're, if we're a true believer, we're still a member of the eternal church. And so he goes on, so ought men to love their wives 
as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, but no man yet hateth, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church, the eternal church, not the local congregations. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church, that is, the eternal church. I will build my church, Jesus said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the gates of hell will prevail against countless members of local congregations who have never become saved, uh, who think they're saved but have never become saved. The hell still claims them because they uh, ha are not uh, under the blood of Christ. They, their sins have not been covered. They are thinking that they are saved. They uh, give the appearance frequently of being a child of God, but they are not saved. And uh, so uh, there is no problem here at all as long as we recognize that the church that Christ died for is not the local congregation. He died, it's true, in his death he made the provision that the local the institution of local congregations might be formed. That's all part of God's program. But, but the, the, insofar as making payment for the sins of everyone in that local congregation, no way, no way. Only for the elect who become true believers, and they are the eternal church. But thank you for calling and sharing that very excellent question. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Canning. Yes. I have a question about two scriptures. Uh, the first one is Matthew 25, verse 21. Matthew 5, 25, verse 21. There we read, uh, His Lord... Uh, uh, now, here is the one who uh, was given five talents... And he went out and, and gained five more talents. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, what is your question? Okay, is he talking about the seal as referred to in Revelation 7? Uh, I'm sorry, is he talking about... Is what what exactly is uh, he talking about? Well, about he's being speaking faithful here for? about those who become true believers. The God, the talents that have been given is the gospel. Okay, what uh, is there the are talent? those who receive the gospel and 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 they nothing happens. They it's like they have hid it away, and that individual still ended up under damnation. But on the other hand. If, if we receive, if the gospel comes into our lives and we do become saved, then there will be fruit. And the fruit is uh, that uh, we share the gospel with others and other people ha do become saved. And, and there is the fruit of the Spirit that shows up in our life, the good works that we do. And this is typified by the five more talents. And, if, uh, and, be, not because we have been faithful, uh, ultimately, but because we have become saved that we enter into the uh, joy of eternal life with the Lord Jesus and will be rulers over many things uh, because we reign with him, uh, as we read in Ephesians 2, for example. have any correlation with Revelation chapter 7? Well, my Revelation question. chapter 7 is giving us a chronological situation. In the beginning of Revelation 7, it speaks about 144,000, 12,000 from each of 12 tribes of Israel, uh, and they can, are, are to be identified with the local congregations throughout the 
New Testament era, uh, who, uh, who uh, uh, have been busy sending out the gospel so that there's a great multitude, uh, that is uh, 144,000, a complete fullness of all those who are to become saved. They are not the great multitude spoken of later. Uh, they are the 144,000. It's just a, the complete fullness of all those who are to become saved through the activity of the local congregations. But until their activity is finished, and those 144,000 have been sealed, that is, their, all the salvation that is to result from the ministrations, the work of the local congregations has been completed. God holds back the, uh, the Great Tribulation. Because notice in, in uh, Revelation 7, it, uh, it says there early on in Revelation 7, it says... Uh, 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 in verse 3, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then it tells about the number who were sealed, 144,000. Now, what was going to do the hurting? We saw that in verse 1. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. But once the 144,000 are sealed, once the, the work of the local congregations has been completed, then the four angels uh, 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 begin to become active. We read in, in uh, Revelation chapter 9, it's saying uh, in verse 14, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And it goes on with the most ugly language uh, uh, to talk about the, uh, the devastation that occurs during this period of great tribulation, and it's directed at the local congregations. But then in verse 9 of Revelation 7, it says, After this I saw a great multitude, a great multitude, uh, 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 or it says, af Yes, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, which stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. And uh, then it was asked, uh, uh, in verse 13, who are these arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? And the answer came, these are they which came out of great tribulation. Make a call, please. I'm sorry? Oh, my, we lost our caller. Shall we go to our next call, please? Hello? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, yes, I have question about transubstantiation? You have a question about which? Transubstantiation? Transubstantiation. Well, you know, that's a theological term that I think identifies with the Lord's table, the Mass. Isn't that true? Uh, and, uh, and it has the idea, if I'm correct about this, I think I am, that somehow the bread and the wine somehow changes into the actual body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of that, of course, is impossible. It is a completely wrong understanding of what the Lord's table is. The Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, is simply an, a ceremonial law, a ceremony that is observed as a teaching tool uh, to show us or direct us to the cross on the one hand and to the completion of our salvation on the other. The Bible says that we eat, we eat this bread and drink this cup, uh, whether it's grape juice or wine, it's, it could be either one. And, and uh, uh, we are, as we do this, we are to remember the Lord's death until he comes. And when he comes, then our salvation will be completed. 
and and it is an outward sign that just as we ate that bread, we are to gain our spiritual life from the broken body of the Lord Jesus, just as we drink the cup, the wine or the grape juice, we are to uh, have the blood of Christ available to us to cleanse us from our sin. And uh, because we do it as a communion service, it is indicative that God is the Savior, Christ is the Savior of all those who are true believers. But uh, transubstantiation, the idea that somehow that bread and wine becomes uh, the actual body and blood of Christ, no, that's a total misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches. And in the, the Holy Communion, though, isn't that correct? He's in you and there with you. Well, the Holy Communion is, you see, the Church, and not only the Roman Catholic Church, but the Protestant Church, have elevated the, uh, the, uh, uh, this ceremony to a place it does not belong. Just as ancient Israel, they fell into the same snare. They were giving law, given laws, ceremonial laws, such as those that had to do with burnt offerings and blood sacrifices and Sabbath observances and special feast days. And they elevated those, those ceremonial laws to the position that if they would only keep those correctly, that would be their salvation. And so the church has done the same thing with this ceremonial uh, uh, the ceremony that God commanded in the New Testament, they have made the Lord's Supper as if that is actually a condition for salvation or actually uh, that uh, somehow adds to our salvation or it has some great spiritual value. And, and all of that is totally wrong. Uh, our salvation is not based in any sense on what we do. And when we're partaking of bread and wine or bread and, and grape juice, uh, we are physically taking an action. And that cannot add one, one uh, iota to our salvation or, or benefit of us spiritually directly at all. It, we simply are to do this uh, because God has commanded it, and we can only do it as long as the church existed because it had to be under the supervision of the church overseers, uh, and as we did that, it would assist the church in remembering the Lord's death until he come. Bear in mind, bear in mind, that for three quarters of the time of the church age, there was no printing press. There were virtually no Bibles available. Uh, it was uh, very, very difficult to find anyone who could read the Bible if they, uh, or even have a copy of the Bible. And so God did give this instruction. Uh, uh, first, that uh, uh, there were to be teachers of the Word of God, but also these external signs like the Lord's Supper and like the water baptism to assist the congregations to have an understanding, a little better understanding of what this salvation really was. But these the ceremonies could never supplant or take the place of the actual salvation work. That is always and never has changed the work of Christ alone. And so it, it, uh, when the moment the church began to call that, uh, that activity a sacrament, they already... I uh, made it wrong. They, it is not a sacrament. It is a sign that is that is given that points us to the cross and points us to the wedding feast of the Lamb of the last day. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Campy. Yeah. I called you last week and... Uh, I was disconnected before I was able to give the other scriptures that I wanted to give because I didn't think fast enough. But uh, there have been a lot of people calling, uh, um, challenging with regard to um, uh, the authority by which you teach. But uh, I had quoted from 1 John chapter 2, 
uh, 27 uh, concerning the fact that the Holy Spirit teaches us. But first, excuse me, First John, chapter two, verse 27. Let's look at that. There we read, I. Uh, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Now, the anointing you have received, every true believer is anointed with the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit gives him, uh, comes to uh, indwell him, and, and from that point on in his life energizes him. And it's all is because at the point of salvation, that individual is given a brand new resurrected soul. It is in that part of his personality that this is going on. And so, ye, and then it says, And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now the fact is, I, it is true that no one can convince someone that they are a sinner in need of salvation. No one convince anybody that it's the end of the church age. No one can argue anyone into the kingdom of heaven. That's impossible. To be taught the, uh, these essential truths has to, is the work of God himself. He is the one who has to open our spiritual ears and eyes so that we can understand these things, and he'll only do that when he has come to save us. And so, uh, we, a lot of times we think, if only I could come up with a good argument, I could convince this person that they ought to come out of the church. Or if I could come up with a good argument, I could convince this person that he's under the wrath of God and he has to become saved. We can only declare what the Bible says, but God has to teach that person, and he will when that person has been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And I really want to thank you for this verse. It's a very, very excellent verse. But now we're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, good evening, um, Brother Kemp. And I had two questions. The first question is, does the Bible reveal exactly when Moses became saved? The Bible has no statement about that at all. Uh, my judgment would be that, uh, well, uh, uh, we can speculate, but he was uh, from a godly family and... Uh, and uh, even though he was trained in all the wisdom of Pharaoh, his heart was with the, with his, the Hebrews, uh, the uh, Jews that were living in, in the land of Goshen. And so my guess is he probably saved, was saved as an infant. Since Judas was among the twelve disciples, and then God had commanded the seventy disciples, the 70 um, disciples in Luke, can God work through the, the sharing a gospel, gospel of unsaved people? Well, yes, they are not an unsaved person who is, is uh, sharing the gospel. Let's say they're passing out a Does God Love You tract uh, or, or witnessing as best they, as they know the gospel. Uh, whatever truth is, it, uh, it is the Word of God that does the saving. It's not the individual that saves someone. It is the Word of God that is presented. However, these who are not saved are not credentialed by God. That is, they are not, they are not uh, receiving any blessing from this activity. They are not... Uh, uh, they are not... Um, uh, uh, this doesn't benefit them in any way. Uh, they are not uh, uh, credited with doing the will of God or anything of that nature. Uh, even, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, it, uh, as it w however the gospel goes out, it is the gospel that does the saving. Okay, Brother Camper, uh, real quick. When the rich man was told in that parable, when he was told... Um, the rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man was told that, remember when thou receivest thou good things, 
uh, when the beggar was outside wanting the crumbs of the rich man, and he was told in, in hell, remember when thou receivest thou good things. Were yeah. they talking about when um, the gospel, could he have been like a church member or something like that? Oh, I, I wouldn't doubt it at all that he is presented as someone who is... Uh, is uh, uh, sh uh, sh uh, thinking for sure I'm a child of God. Uh, the language that is used there certainly gives that impression that he was very, very, uh, uh, he was rich not only in physical blessings, but rich in what he believed was his spiritual in inheritance. I, uh, I, I, I think to, to uh, suggest that out of that parable is, is very possible. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Harold? Yes. Go ahead with your call. Uh, I can hardly hear you. Well, I hear you fine. Go ahead with your call. Uh, Mark 13:32 37. Mark 13:32. Let's look at that. Mark 13, verse 32. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. All right, now what is your question? Uh, verse uh, 33, uh, specifically. Take uh, heed, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Yes. You, you, well, it speaks of time. Yes, it does. Uh, it does speak of time in uh, verse thirty-three, and uh, and uh, we do know that for the unsaved, and when we tie this into Matthew chapter chapter four, uh, twenty-four, we can get a little bit uh, a little bit better understanding, because we read in Matthew twenty-four verse thirty-six. But of that day and hour knoweth no one, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, it's interesting that God directs us directly from this statement. No one knows the day or the hour. Uh, but then he says, it'll be as in the days of Noah. Now, we know that in the days of Noah, they did know the time because uh, God, uh, 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 Noah was a preacher, and he would have been bringing the whole counsel of God, and he had been told that the lifespan of man would be 120 years, which meant that uh, he had 120 years to build the ark. He was later on told seven days before the flood came that he had to enter the ark because in seven days the flood would be there. So immediately we wonder, well, then what is God speaking here then? But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. In other words, they didn't know the day or the hour. Uh, this, this is the example that God is giving of what he means, but no one knows the day or the hour, but you are to watch and be ready. Now, if we are, be, if we're ready, then we know the, the whole counsel of God, and we know a whole lot more about that. That's why we read in uh, in First uh, uh, Thessalonians chapter five, uh, and I come to this again and again in verse one. But of the times and the seasons, there we have time again. Ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And then God explains what he means by a thief in the night. Uh, that is, that no, uh, no one knows when the thief is coming. He explains that. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, 
then sudden destruction cometh upon them, exactly as it was in the, in the, in Noah's day. They thought everything was well, and then sudden destruction came upon them, as travail from a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So God makes a massive differentiation that it is not, uh, he's coming as a thief in the night for the unsaved. Uh, they, they hear with their physical ear that, uh, that Christ may come in a certain, uh, at a certain time, but it doesn't register there in their heart at all. They, they, it's as if they haven't heard it any more than when we're telling people, you know, judgment day is coming. Well, they hear it, but it doesn't register. They go on living as if their judgment day will never be here. And uh, so God, God is explaining how this is. And so if, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if he gave Noah, who represented the true believers of his day, the specific information that he gave, concerning the flood of that day, the utter destruction of the earth of that day, then we're not surprised that he's given us a lot of information in regards to time insofar as our day is concerned. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I have two questions for you this evening. Uh, the first question I have is in regards to the end of the church age. Um, and my question is, if God has stopped saving souls, then what is the purpose behind Christians such as you and I trying to lead unsaved folks to salvation? Well, the fact is, God has not discontinued saving souls. It is true that at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, for a short period, uh, God did stop saving souls. That The Bible speaks of that in the language of uh, Revelation 8, verse 1. There was a, about a half hour of silence from heaven, and that, was, uh, that identifies with the first part of the Great Tribulation. But then, um, during the last part, uh, God, Christ came as the Jubilee, to that, and the Jubilee has to do with the proclamation to the world that there is liberty, there is salvation possible. And that began again. And in our day, God is saving a great multitude of souls. But... The Great Tribulation continues in the local congregations. It is not being done through the activity of the local congregations. They remain in Great Tribulation right up until the end of time. They are in a situation where God has come as the judge to prepare them for that final judgment throne. And that's why he instructs the true believers to get out, to come out because those who remain are going to be further deluded uh, and locked into their wrong thinking. They're being prepared for the judgment throne. Second question this evening is in regards to my listening to your program last evening and the idea, your prediction upon the end of the world occurring some point in time in the year 2011. Uh, I'm curious to know how you've come about, how you've arrived at that prediction, and if there's any point in the scripture, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I'm not sure where in the Bible it is, but uh, I've been taught growing up as a Christian that no man or woman knows the exact day or hour that the Lord will come again. And this, I don't know if it's false prophecy or I'm just curious to find well, out fact, how you came well, about Well, that. the fact is that, uh, for example, for several years now, for several years now, we have been, I've been teaching 
that we have come to the end of the church age. And I have indicated again and again and again uh, during this period of time that the end of the church age uh, uh, coincided with the beginning of that period of great tribulation. Secondly, for several years now, uh, we have been teaching that we're in the last part of that great tribulation time, the time when there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved. Now, that means we have to be very close to the end because the, uh, the Bible is very clear in Re Matthew 24 that as part of the final pattern or the final activity of the end of the world, there will be a period of great tribulation. And immediately following that period of great tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shine. And that is, it will be uh, the end of the world, the appearing of Christ and the end of the world. And so if we are already, and we've been teaching this for several years now, that we're in that period of great tribulation, in fact, in the second part, of that great tribulation and all the pieces are fitting together to assure us of this as we have been examining scripture after scripture uh, during these years and as we have seen the uh, the uh, fact that out there in the local congregations what we're seeing and what we're seeing in the world it attests to the uh, uh, the, the fact that indeed yes it's everything is falling into place so all remain, remains then is, well, then how long is the Great Tribulation? And as we study the Bible, we find that God sets up patterns of this. He set up a pattern for this way back in uh, the days of Joseph when uh, Jacob, his father, was commanded to come out of the nation of, of uh, the land of Canaan and come into Egypt. And, and we study that pattern. And then we have the pattern... Uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, destruction of Judah in 587 BC, when the all the Jews were commanded to come out of Jerusalem and go into the land of Babylon, and God uh, used the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. Uh, that again was a pattern. And when we apply those patterns to our present timetable, our present situation, we find that it focuses on the year 2000. And eleven, and uh, and uh, God uh, uh, gives us some more direct assurances of that, so that if we had at this point of our knowledge of the Bible and and our knowledge of the Scriptures is a, a whole lot greater than it was ten years ago or five years ago, we're learning all the time, and everything is fitting into place that it appears very strongly that the year 2011 will be the year that will end it all. We know we're, we're, uh, we've been, like I say, we've been saying for years now that we're in that second part of the Great Tribulation. So effectively, we've been saying and teaching that we are very near the end, just a few years away. And uh, now that uh, the moment that we uh, pick a number then immediately, uh, it, suddenly, it becomes far more uh, uh, threatening, far more threatening uh, to people, and so they object to that, uh, uh, of course. But the, it doesn't change the fact that uh, we're very near the end, and 2011 is the, is the most likely candidate at this time that we know. And maybe if, if we, as we go along in the next seven years, there may be other information. There is possible, it's possible, there might be other information that we presently do, do not know that will make correction to that. But, uh, and that's why it's so good to talk about this. But at this point, this appears to be the most likely candidate and, and uh, anyone who is, uh, who is uh, trying to evade this question, who is trying to avoid thinking about this, is doing so at their own peril because uh, Judgment Day, uh, whether it's 2011 or, or, or another year, is very, very close. It is very close. And using the number 2011 simply uh, uh, accentuates, it emphasizes the closeness of the return of Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. 
And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Uh, yeah. I have two questions. Uh, yeah. One is, uh, you said that uh, Noah was a preacher. Yeah. And I'd like to know where in the Bible does it say he was a preacher? Uh, yeah, uh, we can learn that uh, in First Peter, chapter two. In First Peter, chapter two. Um, let me see. First, or maybe it was second. No, it was Second Peter, chapter two. Second Peter, chapter two where God says in verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now when it says a preacher of righteousness, God does not give us an outline of the sermons that he preached. He doesn't give a, the outline of anybody's sermons that they preached. Uh, but a preacher of righteousness means they are bringing the whole counsel of God. That is, whatever they have learned from the scriptures, they will teach or preach or publish. The word preach simply means to publish. And so when, when we are told in the Bible that Noah was told that, uh, he had a hunt, that the lifespan of man would be 120 years, and we search the Bible and find that that cannot tie into the life expectancy at any time of humans, uh, 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 it, 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 because after the flood, people continued to live for hundreds of years beyond 120 years, but it had it could only identify with the time when the world was coming to an end in 120 years, and then very very directly God said to Noah, "Get in the ark because, or in seven days the flood will come and put all the animals into the ark and so on." And so if he was a preacher of righteousness, we know absolutely that is what he was preaching, because that's the nature of a preacher. And thank um, you. Jesus' disciples, uh, preachers also? Well, they were. As they learned, they began to preach. But Well, they, turn to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. 17, verse 9. Matthew 17, verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, God, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. All right, now what is Jesus saying? Uh, there's a time w when he is revealing certain things. Now, uh, he's not telling them, you are not to, to, dis to declare this. He's saying, but you wait until I am risen from the dead. Uh, then, and so that's when the apostles officially began their work of gospel proclamation to the world. Up until that time, they were learning. They were students of Christ. Uh, they were uh, being trained. But officially, the work of the apostles began as preachers when, when uh, Christ re returned to heaven. Uh, uh, so well, this Mark, fits right into that. And, and having you read that scripture is to say that just because these men were preachers of God, they preached the word of God, does not mean that, in Noah's case, that God wanted Noah to tell and, and everyone outside of his family what was going to take place. I mean, there's definitely not scripture to back that up. up so that well, if well, we I, said, I, excuse me, though. Excuse me. I, I hear God I picked a specific, Christ specific, I picked a specific piece of information. Uh, discussing the Mount of Transfiguration. That's all that was. Uh, and, and, uh, and, but he did say, in time you are to pre uh, preach this. Now, in the, and we know that officially their work of preaching began after Christ went back to heaven. Now, in, the, uh, in any other case, the nature of a preacher 
The nature of a preacher is to preach the whole counsel of God and to arbitrarily say, well, here is a preacher who has been given a piece of information and we can't know for sure whether he was to declare that and therefore we, we may not say that he did declare it. That is doing, making a shambles of what a preacher is. That is a, that's indicating a complete misunderstanding of what a preacher is. A preacher is someone who is going to bring the gospel uh, uh, and, br and bring the whole counsel of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Hello. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, I can't really hear you, but, um, okay, uh, you say that uh, sending out the gospel is uh, that of fasting? Yes. Is that correct? We, we deny ourselves and, and make ourselves available to share the love of God with others. That is, uh, and God defines this in Isaiah 58. Right. Uh, my, I guess my question is, I, I, I totally understand that. I guess uh, I'm trying to understand that in the light of Matthew uh, 16, verses 16 through 18. Matthew 16, verses 16 to 18. Uh, and Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is that the verse? And no, Jesus... no, I'm sorry, Matthew 6. Oh, Matthew 6? Yeah. Verse 16 to 18. Okay. Uh, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, now it's uh, God, Christ so far is talking about physical fasting, where people are bragging to each other about uh, how they... Uh, how they uh, 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 went through the pain of not having food and and look how, how how bad I look and so on as a result of that in other words poor me uh, look how I suffer in, on behalf of Christ it's a, kind of that kind of an idea but he okay. says when thou fastest anoint thy head and wash thy face now why does he say that to be anointed and to have her face washed is a language of salvation. Make sure that you are anointed with the Holy Spirit, uh, that, your, that your sins have been washed away. That's the first requirement for fasting. And what is the fasting? That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. In other words, it is God who sees us uh, as we, uh, as we, he is the one who has saved us and prepared us to send forth the gospel. As a matter of fact, you remember that other passage where, where they said to him, uh, "Well, uh, why, why don't your disciples fast?" Uh, and and then Jesus said, "How can they fast when the bridegroom is still with them? But when the bride bridegroom has left them, then they will fast." And what was he talking about? Well, the fact is that. The time to, to send the gospel out into the world by the local congregations, that, that gospel explosion that would begin with Pentecost in A.D. 33, had not arrived yet until Christ, the bridegroom, had gone back to heaven. And then, then they began to pass. That is, then they began to send out the gospel in earnest. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have another uh, question for you. Yes. Um, in my walk... Uh, with the Lord, I've learned that uh, I should be removing myself from the church as a worshiper. Um, now, up until this point, I have worked in the church. I have both worked in the church as um, a sound engineer, and I have worshipped in the church. And now that I'm, now that I know that I'm commanded to come out of the church, I wonder where my position lies as far as. Uh, having a job at the church. I know that you said that it's a dangerous place to be in, but I guess well, I was looking for a little bit of your... Why, um, would you, why would you want to be a contributor to a situation that is ruled over by Satan and where God is not working to save anyone? 
why would you want to make be making an assist there? Uh, that uh, that doesn't fall, f follow at all. You know that you have to come out and and you can't give any assistance there anymore. I would. Uh, I, I don't know why you would want to do that to help perpetuate something that you have, have learned yourself you can't be a part of. Why would you want to uh, make it better for others to f uh, make others feel better about being a part of it? We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Kempton. How are you? Well, I'm very well, thank you. Good, good to hear you. Keep up the good messages and all that. Uh, my question to you is, or maybe first statement is this. I think I, the I'm reason sorry. why many I, people sorry. have reservations about... I, I'm sorry, could you return and turn your radio down? Can you hear me? Yeah, let's just turn your radio down. Turn your radio Okay, down. sir. Uh, I think the reason why pro probably many are questioning your annunciations of Christ coming in 2011 is because they are referring you back to the book to, uh, 1994. So the clarification would be, would it be best to say that we think from all that we read in the Bible that we think that Christ may come, there's a probability that he might come, without saying that he, he's definitely coming in 2011? Well, you know, when I, I remember when I was talking about in the years just prior to 1994, we had exactly the same kind of callers, exactly the same kind of callers. We will get them in any case whether I say may or may or possibly, uh, I'm, using, I'm choosing words very carefully. I'm saying that according to my present understanding of Scripture, and, I, and this is not being done promiscuously or superficially or casually. This is after very, very intense comparison of Scripture with Scripture. It's after having uh, been teaching now for several years that we've come to the end of the church age and that we're in the last part of the great tribulation in other words there's an enormous amount of, uh, of background for this statement and it's not too much to say at all that according to our present understanding of scripture 2011 is a is the most likely candidate for the end of, of for the return of Christ now I don't care how I say this uh, there will be those who are going to be troubled. This is an exceedingly awful pronouncement, a terrible pronouncement, because everybody intuitively knows there is a judgment day. But if they don't know the precise timing of the judgment day, it's just sometime, sometime, someday, someday, someday it will happen. Well, they can live with that. that that doesn't bother nearly, nearly as much as when we begin to say, and this could be the time. This is a prime candidate for the time. There's a lot of evidence that points to that. Uh, that now becomes a different matter. Now it is something that, uh, wow, uh, we can think, uh, you mean maybe in seven years I may have to stand before the judgment throne of God that's that's something I cannot accept and so they are going to be greatly troubled uh, but that's the reason that God gives us this information uh, the by uh, I you know I, I I I come back again to Ezekiel chapter 33 Ezekiel 33 and we 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 just can't can't set this kind of these kind of statements aside but but uh, when when God said in Ezekiel uh, 33 uh, uh, in verse 8, uh, uh, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from him. It, and if he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. 
Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye shall speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? And it, it goes on that, uh, or again, he says in verse 2, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him up for their watchman, if when he see the, sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. <coughs> he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand." And, and so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of the Lord at, uh, at my mouth and warn them from me. Now, what, we, what do we warn? We warn whatever we have learned from the word of God. And certainly God is talking directly here about the sword coming. And that sword is judgment day. There is no, no greater uh, uh, greater uh, a threat to the world than that that we are frightened out of our skin when we think about terrorists that may that may uh, uh, strike somewhere in the world and destroy a building or an airplane or whatever but that doesn't hold a candle to this threat this threat is something that we cannot stop it is going to come and we even know uh, it, 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 God has given us enough information so we can declare the likely timetable of its coming. And, and yet it is still the day of salvation. People can still hear and heed the warning and tremble before God and, and beg the Lord for mercy. Understand implicitly what you've said. I mean, understanding in the sense that, yeah, we are a watchman is to give the one and out that uh, judgment is coming. I think that's a, a very, uh, I believe it is understood by many, but the difference is here is uh, declaring that the judgment of God is coming and say, yes, in, uh, in six years is when the judgment is. I think there is a clear distinction. So when you say that, you know, they would argue with you either way, um, I think that's the problem. I think that it's quite okay we're still delivering the message because for any of us, a judgment day could be tomorrow because we could die tomorrow. When we rise up again, it will be judgment day. So for us, that can be of any time. So I think the, the time issue uh, shouldn't be of any concern at all. And I, I think that we only cause more, we will maybe cause more problem if we go on to the idea that we're now able to predict exactly now uh, of when God is going to come. So for sure, the, yeah. The, the problem is, is we cannot uh, reason this out that way. Uh, reasonably, I would have to agree with you. I, uh, from a rational standpoint, I could agree with you. But the fact is, when God gave us the information about the first judgment, uh, the judgment of the flood, God gave very specific time information. It was not believed. It was not. Uh, it didn't register with the unsaved. But nevertheless, God gave very specific time information. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the world of that day heard the timetable. They did not respond. They all, all perished in the flood. That was their problem. But God gave specific time information. And if he did it for then, when we begin to see these uh, pieces of information here and there, when God sets the pattern, shows us uh, what the details of the end are so that we can, uh, can apply that and, and, and we know that there is a precise timetable that God has selected, well, then we have to tell what we know. We have to tell what we know. We, we cannot uh, say 
it's reasonable to do this or to do that. We have to say, what does God want me to do? And we have to bring the whole counsel. I can tell you, for example, when God said, uh, uh, when I learned in the scriptures that we indeed have come to the end of the church age, it was a terrible time in my personal life that I would have to teach that we have to come out of the local congregations. Uh, yeah, it, it was a terrible thing, and yet that is identifying with time, because the time had come. We have to come out of the local congregations. It is a terrible thing to tell the world that, that uh, 2011 may be the last year, that it's the most likely candidate. It's a terrible piece of information. But what, what, what can one do if we are going to be a faithful uh, declarer of the Bible, if we're going to faithfully publish what the Bible has given? And the Bible has given a lot of information about this. That's why I'm preparing a book uh, to, to uh, collate co 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 uh, this information, correlate this information, so that it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, 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 others can study also the scriptures to see if, if, if somewhere uh, I have missed something or, or somehow uh, it isn't quite th that way, as, but they have to show it from the scriptures. Uh, it, now, if I were coming with a dream, or a vision, or an intuition, or, or a feeling, yeah, that, that would be terrible. That would be wrong. That would make me a false prophet. But if I'm coming simply with the, with the facts that I learned from the Scriptures, and I'm simply declaring those facts, well, then that's, that's the role of a, a, someone who is going to be a faithful publisher of the Gospel. Thank you, sir. Keep up the great job. Great job to Family Radio and keep spreading the word. And, of course, we will continue until the Lord comes. So have a good evening, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. Sure. And shall we take the next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Dr. Camping? Yes. Yeah. Brother Hello? Camping, yes. Go ahead with your call. Hello. 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 Yes. All right. Go ahead with your call. I hear you. Hello, Doctor. Uh, I uh, mean, Mr. Camping. Camp. Yes. Um, I have a question uh, in in reference to what the Lord was using me for when I first started going to a lot of churches, and and He had me proclaim that message you're talking about. It would come out of me. Uh, he put that that word in my heart, Revelation 18. And then now he's just like stopped me from even going into the churches that much, but had me proclaim it on colleges and stuff, as well as Old Testament prophets kind of coming together with it. But now he's kind of even putting out my heart to just keep it the simplicity of Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, his death, his resurrection, and he wants to have a relationship with us all. And I almost feel like time of warnings are almost up. And these, these are like birth pains. And I like a quake and shake and bake and tidal wave stuff is going to be coming strong on America. And, I, and I'm, I'm wondering also, in a church of Philadelphia, he said, I will keep you from a time, uh, a time of temptation which shall come upon the whole world. If that came on Philadelphia Church back then, since it doesn't exist, or is it something that's coming that none of us really know what that time of temptation is? Well, the, uh, 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 let's look at uh, the church at Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. Let's see when specifically what God did say there. We read... Um, uh, these things saith he to the church at Philadelphia, he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. 
Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of testing, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now that hour of trial or testing is judgment day. And anyone who is a true believer is kept from the judgment day. We do not stand for trial. And uh, this church at Philadelphia typifies people who ha are true believers. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, th that is, that is what, what every true believer is kept from, the hour of trial. The, when Christ comes and sits on the great white throne, as the language of Revelation 20 presents him, uh, that will be the hour of trial when he is, uh, when, uh, uh, although that trying is already coming, it's already uh, in the world in the sense that, uh, that uh, God is bringing judgment on the local congregations. They're already being tried. Uh, the, uh, there is a separation going on. Uh, there, the tares are being bound for the burning, and the wheat are being cast, is being cast out. It doesn't say temptation, then, an hour of temptation in the well, King the word, James? The word temptation is the Greek word thlipsis, and it is ordinarily translated, it's, it's the same word that's translated testing or trial. In the same sentence, I shall keep them... Uh, 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 from the uh, uh, it says which shall come upon all the world to try them the word try is exactly the same word as the word temptation a different uh, part of gra grammar but it's the same word try uh, to try them it's the hour of trial that will come to try them in other words uh, like when he says it Many of their works will burn up in the end, but I'll save their soul. I'll pull them through the fire and things like that. Well, that I uh, guess you, no man will pluck you from his hand. And I kind of think of that lady that said the anointing will teach you. It ends up saying, now abide in him that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at the day of his coming. That well, next verse. That's simply talking about if we become a true believer we will not stand for trial. Those who stand for trial identify with those who are ashamed. They will be facing all of their sins. It will be too late to do anything about, the, about it. They will end up under the wrath of God forevermore. But thank you, you that... for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Hello? Yes, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Howard Compton. Yes. I hardly hear you. Uh, your voice you is coming me? through well. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Um, My question, I have two questions. The first one is concerning um, your prediction of 2011 being mm -hmm. the last day or when the, the Lord returns. Um, you always say, using Matthew 24, or whatever, where it says, as in the Noah's time, no one knew. It said no one knew. Yes, in the Noah's time, they didn't know it. Fine. But even at all, if you say Noah was a preacher, and you are end-time preacher, or whatever you call yourself, fine. But Noah did not tell the people that it was going to happen, and it didn't happen. No well, one told them it was... Me. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, we've talked about this earlier. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He had been told by God uh, that he had a, that the lifespan of man would be 120 years. All right, he has received a message from God, and so he would be declaring it now, just in a very practical way. Just think for a moment. Uh, here is Noah building this huge boat, this huge craft, and people are are asking him, "What are you doing? What 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 is this all about?" And Noah is a preacher. It gives him opportunity to declare what God has told him. There's a flood coming. 
that's going to destroy this whole world. That's why I'm building this. Uh, it, it, uh, he had more reason to talk about time than anybody did. Uh, this, uh, and as they watched that, uh, that huge boat uh, take shape, uh, 500 feet long and over 80 feet wide and and uh, 45 or 50 feet high. It was a huge craft. Uh, he became the talk of the world of that day, and they watched it coming to completion. Uh, and and uh, do, you, do we think that they had no interest in that? They had no. They didn't ask any questions. We we would have to be. Uh, uh, they would have to be di different people than people of today. The fact is, it gave uh, Noah all kinds of opportunity to preach. And what is the subject that they're interested in? Why this huge boat? And what is the answer? God is coming as the judge. He's going to destroy this world with the flood. And and you don't you think they're going to be asking, well, when do you think that's going to happen? Well, Noah just gives them the facts. God told me thus and so, just like we have the facts. God said thus and so. We declare what God has said. And so we can, we can uh, deceive ourselves and think for a moment that no, Noah wouldn't have talked about time at all. But that it just doesn't make any sense. And secondly, it doesn't match the nature of a preacher. A preacher preaches everything that God has given him to tell. And so we, we don't have to think for a moment that, that Noah, uh, that, that these people did not hear. They heard. But you see, the Bible says that God has to give us ears to hear. We can hear with our physical ear, but we don't necessarily hear in our hearts. And for the unsaved of the world, Christ is coming as a thief in the night. Uh, that is, no one knows the day or the hour for the unsaved. And God specifically says in 1 Thessalonians 5 that ye who are uh, believers, Christ does not come as a thief in the night. We do listen to God. We do hear what God is saying. So we don't want to try to wallow in the unbelief and the blindness of the unsaved just because they don't know. We don't have to say, well, then we don't know anything either. That's just like saying, well, they don't know anything about the nature of salvation, so we don't know anything about the nature of salvation either. No, the fact is, when we're a true believer, we know a whole lot of things because God has opened our spiritual ears. And, and yet the, true, the unsaved do not know these things. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Well, Hello. Yes, good evening. How are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, I know you're almost near the end, so I'll make it quick. Uh, Luke 18, verse 31 to 34. Luke 18, verse 31 to 34. Let's look at that. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit, up, uh, spit upon, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Okay, my question is this. It says the apostles did not understand, but in Luke chapter 9, when Christ sent out the apostles to preach the gospel, it says nine, uh, Luke 9 verse 6, what gospel did they preach if they didn't understand that Christ was going to rise from the dead? Oh, well, they, pre they preached whatever they knew, whatever they knew, and it was an incomplete gospel, of course. Uh, actually, what Christ is saying here is that even though they heard, they heard, they had been told, they did not know because God had not opened their spiritual ears to this. But then remember when the two disciples were with Jesus, in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, 
and after Jesus spoke to them for a while, and then he broke bread with them, and then their spiritual ears and eyes were opened, and they recognized that they had been talking to the Lord Jesus. Then everything began to fit into place, and they began to understand. In other words, God has a timetable for it. The same is true here when we're talking about these, uh, these details of the end, that when we talk about a period of great tribulation, when we talk about that, great peri uh, that period being divided into two parts, when we talk about the latter rain where, and, and many other things of a similar nature these past few years, uh, for uh, all through the church age, these things were never discussed with any clarity or with any understanding because God had not opened the ears of anyone. It's always been in the Bible. We're not, we're not adding a, one word to the Bible. We're, finding, we're using the same Bible they used 500 years ago. But they did not understand because it was not the timetable for it. But today it is the timetable. And that's why these kind of facts begin to tumble out. We're learning this, we're learning that, we're, uh, and we're getting more and more precision in our understanding of the nature of salvation, more precision in our understanding of the timetable of the history of the world. We, all kinds of things we're learning today that have always been in the Bible, but it's only in our time that God is opening our spiritual ears to it. My, my, what I, my final question about what I just asked is in Luke chapter 9, verse 6, where it says the apostles preached the gospel. Give Luke me an example 9. of what they might have told me if I was living at that time. What would I have heard from them as far as that part of the gospel? Luke 9, verse 6, and they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. They preached. What did John the Baptist preach? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That certainly was being preached. That certainly was being preached. Uh, and and uh, uh, that, uh, that Christ was the Messiah. They didn't understand what he, how, how it all, would all work out, uh, what it meant that he had to go to the cross, that he had to be crucified, and all kinds of those details they did not understand. But at least they had a... A, a much more knowledge than uh, they did before Christ appeared. Uh, they at least could preach that the kingdom of God was at hand, for example, and that's an integral part of the gospel. But thank you for calling. We've come to the end of our time, so I must say good night. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. <laughs> 